Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second LBS SRA Energy Talk, where we focus on internships in the energy sector. I am Meloni Parikh, a Masters in Finance student at London Business School, and I would like to welcome the two alumni joining us this evening. They will be sharing their experience with internships and how it shaped their future career. We have with us Mohsen Kelardin Garcia. LBS MBA 2018 alumni and Jonathan Peralta, Esade MBA 2020 alumni. Mohsen has a bachelor's in economics from London School of Economics and an MBA from London Business School. He is an energy investment professional and independent advisor. He's previously worked with Wheeling Group and Shell in their business development team. Jonathan is an engineer and has an MBA from Esade. He also did an exchange program with Red McComb School of Business in Texas. Jonathan currently works in transaction advisory with Ford Initia in Berlin and has interned with Green Investment Group Macquarie. We also have with us tonight Francisco Gabrielli from Isade, who will be moderating today's event. Uh, please feel free to share any questions you might have, and Francisco, I'm sure, will make every effort to discuss them during this session. Uh, I would just request Francesco to please start the session. Yes, thank you, Miloni, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, as you can see, uh, I've already been joined by our two guests, Jonathan and Mosen. Uh, welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Hi, thanks for having me over. And Miloni already did a brief introduction of you, but like I would like to ask directly from you uh, to tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what are you currently doing. Do you want to take it first, Jonathan? Sure. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, I'm Jonathan. I'm from Spain. I'm originally from Bilbao, born and raised there. And my background is in mechanical engineering. I um, um, was most of the of my career working in aviation in Germany, uh, in the Airbus environment and in Rolls Royce. Uh, but then I, I just a chance of, of doing the MBA to, to change sectors. I really wanted to go to renewable energies. And well, I devoted my whole experience to do that. And um, it worked out well. So uh, on my side, uh, I'm actually by origin half uh, Spanish, half Iraqi. My mother's from Spain, father's from Iraq, but I grew up in London in the UK. Uh, so I consider myself quite British as well. Um, and I, I did most of my education uh, in the UK, uh, economics at London School of Economics. And then I went on to do the MBA at London Business School. Um, and I've spent uh, all my career pretty much in the energy sector. Uh, initially a number of years at Shell uh, as an investment professional um, and kind of frontline commercial business development work uh, in oil and gas um, uh, across various countries in Europe, Africa and South Asia and subsequently in renewable energy uh, since uh, the MBA uh, when I spent a number of months working part-time for a renewable energy developer and then subsequently full-time with them uh, for the subsequent uh, th two and a half, three years. Uh, and the last five months or so as a, an independent advisor uh, helping uh, renewable energy developers to raise capital for their projects uh, in Europe, Africa and the Middle East. Amazing. And um, as you very well know, we today the focus of this uh, panel is talking about uh, internship in energy. So I'm sure there are a lot of students right now listening to us that uh, want to know all about how you managed to get the internship, how the internship went, uh, um, what, you, what did you do during the internship? So going in order, uh, I would like to ask you a little bit of some details about uh, your internship. Sure. Should Who we just go? Yep. Yeah. Go. I can. Yeah. So um, I did my internship at, at Macquarie, at, the, at their green investment group. For those who don't know it, Macquarie is uh, the biggest infrastructure manager in the world. Uh, they're present in, in every continent and they, they have uh, offices in, in many countries. So uh, the way I managed to, to get this was uh, via my exchange. I, I, I did my MBA in, in Nesada, as it was said here, but then 
uh, with the opportunity of having an exchange in so many so many partner schools. I chose Macombs because they do have a, a very uh, strong track record and they even have specializations in energy finance and clean tech. And um, that was then uh, what I thought would help me more to not coming from the from this sector, but would help me more build my story on um, going forward. And also I took part in, in, in the clubs as I was in, in SADE. I was part of the uh, Energy Environment Club. I was vice president of, of events. So there I also joined uh, the clubs, Energy Finance and, and Clean Tech. And just like that is how, how, how I heard about this opportunity, which was perfect for me because it was an off-cycle internship. So I could just do right after my, my exchange. And, and it was great. It was uh, working on um, investments in, in PV, also in solar uh, farms, utility scale, very big investments in, in the US. And uh, for me, it was amazing. And it's what, what's helped me find my, my full-time opportunity after that. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned that you did it off cycle. So um, if I recall well, it was in winter that you did this, uh, this interview. Did, I want just to highlight this, uh, was correct, was it in winter? Yeah, it was in winter, but it was definitely not cold. It was in Austin, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so it was but, warm still. Yeah, but I, I wanted to highlight the disaster because now we are approaching summer and uh, probably many of uh, our, my colleagues and Miloni's colleagues uh, are still looking for an internship, are under stress because they feel and they think that the only opportunity and the only window to do internships in, is over the summer. So this is a very great example because... Uh, there are other opportunities uh, still also in fall, uh, in winter. So uh, to everyone who's hearing, hearing us and uh, who hasn't secured an internship yet, uh, don't panic, don't worry, trust the process uh, and uh, uh, opportunities will come. Exactly. It's about, it's about uh, not giving up. It's about looking for the opportunities. And in, in my case, I'm happy that it happened like this because it gave me also the the opportunity to have a longer internship, it was 15 weeks in the end. It's some summer they're usually like 10, between eight and 12. So, and for me, it just followed like a, a logical path. So it's not that it's bad, it actually can be even better. Yes, and we saw the message from SAD Careers that actually more, <laughs> more opportunities will come after summer. But Mosen, back to you. Yeah, no, thank you. So I, I, I actually share uh, quite a few of uh, you know, the points you made, uh, Jonathan, and uh, definitely agree with the view that, um, you know, you will have uh, more opportunities outside of the summer. And the main reason for that, in my view, is uh, the energy uh, sector and particularly renewable energy, if that's an area you want to go into, um, is growing very fast, but it's not a traditional uh, MBA hiring destination. And so the result is that you know, unlike consultancies and banks and some of the PE funds and some of the industry players, especially, you know, the Amazons of this world who hire dozens and dozens of MBAs every year, uh, these guys aren't structured in that way. Um, and there's also quite a large number of, um, you know, smaller uh, players, developers, uh, boutique investors, boutique funds, um, you know, who, who, you know, just because of their size and scale will not be actively engaging with MBA hires uh, or business school hires for that matter, uh, but who are potentially interested in the sort of um, uh, experiences um, and knowledge that, that those kind of candidates might have. So what that kind of means is that it puts more pressure in some way on, on you as a student um, you know, to do a lot of the informal stuff that may open up opportunities for you. Um, and it means you have to have a degree of uh, patience. But then the flip side is, because it's unstructured, um, I guess there's kind of two main benefits that I saw, and I'll explain how that played into my, my own experience. Benefit number one is, um, you know, you could actually end up gaining a more meaningful experience uh, because it's not so structured. You could end up maybe working for a few months. You could maybe be doing it full time or part time whilst you're studying. It may happen at a point in your studies uh, that is complementary because it allows you to do something else in your summer, which is a bit more empty. Um, and at the same time, the second key benefit is that um, you're potentially more appreciated as an asset in that particular business because um, you know you're not just another business school or MBA student who uh, is you know, one of a number of slots that they just have on an annual basis. Um, 
and uh, I wouldn't uh, for a second think to um, uh, criticize some of our colleagues who gone who have gone to the likes of McKinsey or to Amazon or to any of those big hires. But the reality is sometimes your ability to make an impact and to grow is more limited when you're just one of many with that same sort of profile, even though each individual is, of course, very, very unique and adds value uh, in a very specific way. Um, coming on to my experience, uh, I came on to my MBA at London Business School um, with uh, an objective to transition from uh, oil and gas or fossil fuels into renewables. Like That was one of my main objectives. I wanted to stay in the sector. I'd learned a lot. I loved how international that industry was. And I could see that there was a growing uh, opportunity to work in renewables. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, 2016, 17, when I was when I was doing my MBA, uh, I hadn't quite gotten to the point where maybe like now or the last year or so, where a lot of professionals in that oil and gas industry are now trying to move across, or at least their companies are trying to grow in that area. So in a way, that was beneficial for me um, because uh, you know I had energy experience, which was relevant. I had infrastructure experience. I had international experience, uh, primarily on the commercial investment and business development side of things. Um, and so I could potentially convince somebody that although I hadn't done any renewables work, I could transition that quite easily. The flip side is um, I noticed a lot of the more structured hires in that space uh, some of the funds, some of the larger funds, the infrastructure funds and the private equity funds, um, in addition to maybe some of the big corporate energy players, uh, utility companies and so on, uh, were looking for a particular profile that wasn't necessarily mine. Um, and so, uh, again, it just meant I had to kind of double down on the informal side of things uh, in order to try and, and gain something. Um, and the irony of all of this is that I actually ended up getting a job um, at WeLink, which is a renewable energy developer. Uh, it's an Irish-based uh, company, but it had a pretty sizable office in London running some of its operations uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, and the irony is I got that uh, opportunity through the LBS portal because the uh, chief investment officer of WeLink Energy uh, was a guy who'd done a few courses at LBS. And so he was looking for somebody with an LBS sort of background, but he didn't know what it was. He didn't really think much of it. He just wanted somebody from LBS. And so I just applied for that role uh, and I managed to land it after the interviews. Uh, and so my recommendations here, ironically, don't necessarily mean it leads to exactly what happened for me. I was just lucky. Um, they were looking for somebody who could join in May. Uh, and so I actually started working with them towards the end of my first year. I was still doing some of my exams and other things. They just needed somebody to be available as soon as possible. Um, and I ended up staying with them all the way through to April of the next year on a part-time basis after kind of spending most of my summer with them as well. So they wanted something very, somebody who was very flexible. They wanted at that time somebody who spoke Spanish because they had a bunch of renewable energy projects in Spain and they wanted somebody who could just quickly hit the ground running with financial modeling. And I had happened to do a lot of that in my previous role at Shell. Um, so I was just in the right place at the right time. However, if I hadn't landed that role, then likely I would have landed something maybe not too dissimilar uh, and that was just because I had made a lot of effort, you know, like Jonathan said, spend time with the energy clubs in your in your university, get to know the network, reach out to the alumni who are in the sector who tend to be very helpful because they know that it's not kind of a traditional sector where anybody from the business school can have walk in and at least apply. Uh, it's a sector that you really need to kind of put your effort into to get to know the people and the businesses. So reach out to your alumni network. That's something that I did a lot in the preceding months and even the subsequent months. Um, and also uh, try and spend as much as your of your time as possible engaging with some of the activities that will allow you to gain experiences as well. So in my case, I had some relevant experience um, and that helped. Uh, but I think the industry is getting more and more competitive. So uh, the more that you can uh, you know, participate in certain things that allow you to demonstrate the types of experiences that are relevant for your role. If, for example, if you're going into an investment space, make sure you know or you can demonstrate that you know how to, how to do financial models. The MBA or your business school course won't necessarily be sufficient for that. Um, and that will get tested. So, you know, there are things that you can do other than additional courses. I actually participated in something called uh, Mint, M-I-I-N-T, which was a great competition. It was an investment competition. And my team was one that was focusing on 
um, potential companies in the renewable energy space. So uh, that was something that I could talk about and demonstrate as well as a, as a dem you know as a way of demonstrating my interest in the sector, given that I wasn't coming uh, from a, a renewable energy company at that point. Uh, but at least I had something that kind of linked me into that. So these are all these extra things that you can do, bearing in mind that uh, it is, it's probably getting more structured, I imagine. I don't know how it is since I, I left business school, but it's an area that, uh, that at the very least when I was there, uh, was quite unstructured. And it's only every now and again that you're going to see a post or an opportunity uh, coming up on your careers portal. Um, and even then make sure that you have good things to talk about when you turn up. So those are just some of the thoughts uh, that I hope uh, are valuable to everyone listening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I completely agree that the, the energy sector is not the usual and uh, most common target out of the, the MBA. So uh, if you're interested in, in that area, you have to work, leverage your network. So, so my next question uh, goes a little bit in this direction and you already touched on your side on, on most of the, of the points and it was about how did your experience during the your MBA and uh, respectively as ADE and London Business School help you um, to, 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 to land in, 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 a, in the job in the, in the energy uh, industry. So I wanted to ask and hear also from, from Jonathan and his experience. Yeah, in line with what Mosen said, I, I think I can agree with every single point that every single point that he said. But for example, I'm I'm working in finance now. My in, uh, internship was in finance too. So obviously, being an engineer, I just uh, like the basic finance that I learned there was it maybe wasn't enough. Obviously, you have to know more than you have to like then link it to your past experience on how okay now I know this much and I can show you because of how I changed from this role to here. Um, that it will be enough that I'm capable of then uh, in a very short period of time, like become a, 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 a valuable asset. Um, but obviously, um, it, it's at the end of the day also for me, it was like linking to all of these other activities. I also took, took part in a case competition that uh, that was in energy transition, doing a, a financial, um, so a financial analysis of a company, um, my team won, so that obviously always that looks good on the on the CV, and as as Mosen said, it's very important. It gives you something to talk to when you're when you're doing uh, to talk to, not to talk about when you are uh, when you are networking, when you are contacting someone, when you are having an interview, and and um, and to build on that, for example, I, I took the the opportunity of this change. So, so what I did is look for things that were not on the, on the curriculum of my home school. Obviously, going to a, a university with 50,000 students and, and with a lot of flexibility to choose so from, from different degrees, it was even possible. Um, I did do this very specific course that was uh, doing a financial analysis and, and investment proposals on a project finance, uh, renewable energy projects. So when I, I just describing that when I was in my first interview for this internship, so what, what they told me is like, well, that's what we do here on a daily basis. So that's this. These things that you might think that they don't add so much value at the end of the day, it might be like the yes or no on, on, on an offer. So definitely go and, and look for those things that are different and are going to, uh, are in, in line with what you want to do, in line with the sector you want to go to, but that also will like, set you apart from the competition. That's that's what I can say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, if I share some thoughts, uh, so I guess uh, Francesco, uh, this is just uh, this. This stream is only going out to current students. Am I correct? Um, yes, but it, it was open to everybody, so <laughs> there right. could be anyone. So <laughs> it, it would uh, obviously these moments is where it helps to have the audience right in front of you. But I'm just I want to be a kind of a, a little bit direct in my thoughts here, and and only in in the interest of hopefully helping. Uh, how people think about this. Um, yeah, you know, my personal view is uh, your your business school experience is driven by what you've done before, um, uh, as much as what you what you're doing while you're at business school. And so, what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you're somebody who, uh, like me, you know, you already kind of worked in the sector or the adjacent sector to what you're trying to go into, um, you've had a, a kind of very commercially driven experience, and you want to go into a commercial role. Um, so, you know, the difference between what I was doing before and after is perhaps not as significant or as large the, in terms of kind of the gap or whatever, as I said, the difference than 
for somebody who maybe like Jonathan, who was who came from an engineering background and was using his MBA uh, or, or, or business school experience to transition into, uh, in this case, a commercial or investment role, right? So what I'm trying to say is, um, in my case, uh, the business school experience at LBS wasn't necessarily so valuable because of some of the courses I did, even though I did specifically choose courses where I felt I had gaps in my knowledge and you know, I, I, I cannot fault them for a second. But actually, when I look back, what was so much more valuable for me was, I guess, a couple of key things. One was the network um, and just being able to speak to people and just say, hey, you went to LBS or you are at LBS and you have an interest or you had an experience or you're currently actively working potentially even as a leader in this sector that I want to get into, you know, just just having that conversation, then being part of your network, uh, that is really, really significant. And in many occasions, now, later, it will open doors um, that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of. And then, of course, uh, just the fact that you have that label or that badge, um, you know, I don't know if some people may not like to say it, but the reality is, uh, especially in in certain, you know, it can work in larger or smaller organizations, but I found that it probably has more of an impact in some smaller organizations where people need to be all-rounders in many respects. When I joined Wheelink Energy, um, you know, I was, uh, well, at one stage, I was the director, the manager, and the associate and the analyst at the same time. Uh, I had to do everything. Um, and perhaps part, or maybe not necessarily all, but part of the reason why, uh, senior managers in my company were comfortable to give me those responsibilities because they knew that I'd gone through effectively an all-rounder, you know, leadership, management, uh, modeling, uh, business course at LBS. And obviously the fact that it was LBS, uh, you know, th that it was a, you know, a well-known institution helped as well. So there's a degree of kind of virtue signaling perhaps, you know, I don't know if people like to talk about it much, but I think that actually does play a role in certain organizations in terms of them saying, okay, well, this guy, you know, has gone through his past work experiences, tick that box. He's now also, or she's now also gone through a very challenging course uh, that's not easy to get into, but they're not necessarily thinking, oh, you know, that person took project finance and therefore we should give them responsibilities in project finance. Uh, you know, that can, that can play a role. Maybe they see it on the CV and they just kind of tick that box. What matters more is kind of, you know, in their minds, the filtering mechanism that you've gone through um, and the knowledge that, you know, you're somebody who's, you know, worked quite hard to get to where you are um, and is probably going to be quite driven to continue uh, that sort of uh, work ethic in your new uh, organization. So, you know, it's as much, I guess, about the courses and the content, which frankly, and, you know, I don't know if the career's people will like me saying this, but frankly, you can pick that up online if you want to, and you don't need to pay a hell of a lot of money uh, for that. What really matters is, you know, what you're effectively, the message that you're sending people about who you are and, and your, you know, what you're trying to do, as much as also, of course, what I think is the biggest value of it all is, it's the network, it's the people that you meet on your course and in the alumni. And uh, I'm glad to see that that Vince is uh, is sending a message through because, He's a guy that I met on my course, and I have a lot of time for him. Yes, and also he highlights too the, the importance of uh, network strategy. So I, I don't know if you guys want to share some practical tips on how to effectively build an, uh, an effective uh, um, networking uh, strategy. I don't know if you have some practical tips that you, you remember from your experience that you feel that you want to share uh, to yeah, definitely. Well, I think for me, uh, one thing very important, at least from my experience, is uh, to do the networking where you want to do it in, in the sense that if there is a company presentation that you're not interested on, I wouldn't waste my time and the, the people from that company time either because they feel it. They feel it when you're not really interested. So I will go and, and, and be a little bit selective on what I want to do and maybe uh, put aside a little bit of the noise around you. Like if everybody is going to, to talk with Google, but you don't want to work for Google, then don't do it. That, that, that will be one thing. And because I felt then when I was discussing, then for me, it was just more natural. It wasn't, it wasn't networking because I have to network. I was actually enjoying talking to those people. And then 
uh, find the, uh, an strategy that's in, in line with what was uh, written in, in that comment. Find a strategy that works for you. It's like if you are a little bit, um, how to say, like chaotic on the way you are networking, you will forget who you've spoken to, who you have spoken already. Find, find that sector that works for you. Um, I, I think I read a book actually to prepare an strategy. I, I'm not going to say them to not do <laughs> marketing or whatever, but like find that way where you are going to be also structured on doing it and not feel forced, also not feel overwhelmed and, and try to find it, to make it a way that is actually enjoyable while you're doing it because if not, it's like the most tedious thing in the world, at least for me. Yeah, I, I would really kind of pick up on that point there. It's, it's about what works for you. I mean, in my, for me, for example, I, I'm quite an unstructured person. I, I pretend to be structured and then I realize I'm really not. So, you know, I, initially I kind of, I don't know, I must have put it together some sort of Excel and said, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And I probably also filled in some sort of template that they would have given me in one of those sessions that the careers people run, which is great, but it just didn't work for me. What I realized was that I just, you know, I just wanted to, speak to people and uh you know take on board their thoughts and their views and perhaps even uh in in certain cases find that there's a door opening because i happen to be in the right place at the right time which in an unstructured universe uh can happen so uh, i i literally just uh you know thought to myself well how do i reach um as many relevant people especially amongst the alumni community as quickly as possible and there's you know, intuitively, there's probably a couple of ways you can do that. One is you can go on LinkedIn or you can go and use, uh, I don't know, for Isade, but on LBS, there's sort of internal directory and you can kind of, you know, it's not great, but you can kind of filter through it in terms of industry and experience. So whether it's one you want to go into renewables or whether you want to go into uh, oil and gas or whatever, any wider energy field, you can kind of find a way to figure out who's in that sector and all their contact details are there. And then it's just as simple as, you know, you could argue again, okay, well, I have a strategy and what do I say and how do I say it? But just send the message. And in my view, it's more important to be proactive than to spend uh, too much time uh, trying to design a strategy and not implementing it. Um, and so if you're just proactive and you recognize that, you know, some people may not appreciate your message, some people may do, some people will not respond, some people will. Uh, but ultimately, if you put it, out, put it out there as much as you can, with kind of a genuine desire to not waste that person's time and actually learn from them uh, and hopefully just offer them also, uh, you know, something, you know, nice in return, whether it's your time or your support, even if they don't take you up on it, um, that, that will go, I think, a much longer way uh, to helping you, uh, you know, uh, develop that network and, and, and make use of it as well. Uh, so just don't, don't sit around, just, just get out there and, and, and speak to as many people as you can and learn from their experiences. If I may add something very uh, short, uh, in line with that, yes, uh, start, uh, well, start as soon as possible, of course, but just send those emails out, <clears throat> those LinkedIn connections or whatever, but just do it and don't sit around and wait to be replied. If they reply, right. If they don't, next. So, like, people have the enough amount of time. If someone wants to help you, good. If not, move to the next, don't take it personal and, 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 Pass on the like, skip that uh, fear of rejection. Yeah, I no, no one I think likes to receive two follow-up emails. If they haven't responded, then just move on. I agree. Yeah, very useful tips, and uh, especially like the point where you said about remaining remaining focused on on uh, on the goal and uh, on the objective. Um, because I, I directly uh, experienced the noise, uh, the. Um, the depression, sometimes the fear of missing out. Uh, at some point, uh, it looks like everybody already got an internship and uh, you're the only one that uh, hasn't. So you may feel uh, it's easier to actually go to every company presentation and apply to to, to, to every uh, company out there. So uh, my, my next question is a little bit uh, uh, around this. So how do you remain focused on, on, on your uh, on goal and how do you handle this kind of pressure and fear of missing out, some peer pressure that you can feel uh, um, from outside? Who wants to take it first? You want to go first, Jonathan? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let, <let's carry laughs> We've got this go order, so we might as well. <laughs> uh, to be honest, uh, up to today, I still don't know how I manage. A lot of people told me, like, I don't know how you are actually it's like so calm and, and I would be already applying to everything. I just knew what I wanted to do. I just knew that if I, I would take anything that wouldn't make me happy with me, like 
being more miserable than not having an internship or even when I was looking for my full time. I, I, I left my job, I left my life uh, before the MBA passed to do something and I just follow it. Like, I, I, I couldn't see any other alternative. Yeah, it's, it's difficult when you've got a lot of, uh, you know, your, your colleagues on your courses uh, going down a, a path where, you know, a, a good percentage of them are doing that, you know, whether it's consulting or, or you know, some parts of industry or, or banking, whatever. Um, and, and so, you know, you can get carried away. And in my case, I came into the MBA knowing that I wanted to transition to renewable energy, knowing that, you know, where I could really continue to build a career um, is is in that space because of my background because it interested me, uh, but then all of a sudden it was November of the first year and people were doing case studies, um, and I kind of just thought, well, should I should I not be doing that as well? I mean, you know, uh, because at that point you know, you can't really see anything on the horizon in the industry that you want to go into because it's so unstructured. So it's easy to get carried away with some of the structured processes that people around you. Are participating in and in my case i actually went and i did a few uh, case interviews and i got to the second round of mckinsey and i'd never prepared a case before i got past the first round properly and so i thought oh actually maybe i'm good at this and maybe i should do this and then of course uh, i i did terribly in the second round um and that was kind of reality hitting me back in the face and reminding me that actually that's not what i want to do the very fact that uh, i hated even the idea of preparing for it like that was because <laughs> It wasn't something that I actually enjoyed, um, and you know, aside from the fact that I'd, ke I'd come from a business like Shell, which had a wonderful work-life balance, and I kind of, you know, I, I, I felt I wanted to prioritize that as well. So um, the result is that uh, you know, sometimes you might have to go through these things to some extent to remind you of what it is that you really want to do. It's nothing like actual experience. Uh, going through those interviews, uh, going through that competitiveness. Uh, and then seeing, okay, well, I'm either cut out for it or I really want to do it or I'm not cut out for it or I don't want to do it or both. Um, but uh, And that was maybe to some extent my experience. But either way, just remind yourself that whatever other people around you are doing, uh, you've come onto the MBA or onto your course uh, through merit and uh, it's not been easy to get to where you are. So there will be somebody, an organization, or a group of people that you might even team up with uh, who values what you've done before and values that you've done and something like a, an MBA at a top university on top of that. So don't get run, you know, don't get carried away. Uh, be patient um, and just double down on your efforts to find the thing that you want to do. Uh, don't just take the first thing that, you know, you, you think you might be offered or that you think you can do because it happens to be structured. Um, because that unfortunately can end up with you kind of thinking, well, okay, well, it's too much of an opportunity cost for me to turn this down uh, because, you know, I've got a clear, you know, salary and I've got a clear internship for a couple of months and it's a nice brand or it's a good company. Uh, that's potentially what you had before the MBA. So remember, the MBA uh, is there, hopefully, I think at least, um, to let you do a bit more of what you want to do. Um, and if that's what you really want to do, fine. But if you didn't come into the MBA to specifically do that, don't get carried away just because other people do. Just try and remind yourself of that and eventually you will get to what you need, you want to do. Thank you. I, I completely uh, agree. Um, and in, in, uh, in what you were saying, you also mentioned about uh, transitioning. So I wanted to, for my next question, I want to build up on that point. Um, especially also for people that maybe do not have a, a background in, uh, in the energy inter industry. So um, how would you adv advise them to leverage their existing skill set to um, actually make it in the, in the energy industry? I mean, from, from my perspective and my experience, I think it's a very tough uh, sector to move into coming from a, uh, that's, that's been my experience. So it's even more important. It's important in every change and in every new job that you really leverage your skills, but it's even more important here. Uh, that's my feeling, I guess. I guess most and well, you kind of said the similar thing, even coming from, from oil and gas, it was difficult to make it to renewable, so you feel it a little bit. But coming from, from a totally different sector, for me, it was like really, really a, a setback. It was very difficult. So you have to really link every single thing that you think you can, you can add um, 
value in that company. I mean, at the end of the day, there's uh, these uh, general skills or these transferable skills that will be valuable in any company, but you just need to know tailored to every single um, job posting, for example, which ones are the ones that you have that all of all, everybody that is listening here has a lot of them. You need to find out which ones are the ones that you can for sure um, use in this new position. You cannot, you should also look at your weak points on how to at least uh, cover for them in case that you are asked um, about them and then build your story on why you want to move uh, here, what have you done, um, etc. A little bit what, what we have been saying. So it's not only the MBA that you done, definitely the MBA can help you to get a, a, a job in the energy sector uh, when you think about the function, but not for the to the sector itself. So that you have to to build on other things, and it's not easy. And but I don't think it's easy in, in any sector since. But here, seriously, um, work a lot on that. Think think what are your strengths. Um, in my case, I was thinking because I was working in, in a safety relevant uh, industry. So I'm super good at risk management. I'm good at due, due diligence, et cetera. Not real due diligence, but technical. So you have to go and really look a little bit, make here a puzzle on, on what is it I've done? Where, where is the link? You have to do it anytime, uh, but, uh, but for this sector, you definitely have to do it like twice as much. That's yeah. what I feel. No, I, I agree entirely with you, Jonathan. Like it's it's you you really do need to um, uh, try and link in or bridge into uh, what they need in that particular position, and so it will depend heavily on what it is that you're going for. I mean, as a broad example, if we're talking about renewables, there are investment funds, uh, both infra and private equity, is kind of a general point. Obviously, debt funds as well in that kind of wider space. Uh, there are investment teams within investment banks or advisory teams effectively that focus on the renewable space and help others to raise capital or whatever it is. Um, there are developers like the one that I worked for. Um, there are big energy conglomerates. There are obviously the oil and gas companies now that have a significant renewable energy teams or even if you're going into an oil and gas company in, in the first place. Um, and there are the utilities and everything else in between. And all of them have different needs as a kind of general rule I, I having kind of been in shell and then being in a really small now kind of being working on my own to some extent um so I've, i guess i got a bit of a broader experience uh, of the different companies um uh, i would argue the smaller the organization uh the more likely that they might actually value some of the things that you have especially if your experience is less directly relevant uh than a larger organization that will be either uh, through a structured internship or maybe even a specific position, uh, they'll be recruiting for a very specific team uh, with a specific skill set. Um, so, you know, the, I, I would argue if you really are keen on getting into the sector uh, and you have, um, you know, uh, a, a set of experiences that are not so easy to relate, just remember that there will be one or more things in your background plus of course the mba which gives you that kind of broad generalist uh, experience and hopefully reinforced by some of the courses uh, some of the competitions some of the experiences you had whilst on the mba you know that combination is what you really need to hone in on uh, as an example a number of the entities that i mentioned you know one of the main things that they probably look for especially if you're more on the investment side is going to be financial modeling experience so you could be an engineer or you could be uh, an architect, you could be a doctor, doesn't really matter. Make sure you can tick that box if you're going for uh, a position in one of those organizations uh, on the investment side. And that's where I've noticed quite a few of the opportunities are, but perhaps that's because also I happen to have that experience. So I was always trying to leverage it when I was looking for positions. Uh, another thing is potentially languages, something that anybody of any background may well have, especially in an MBA, MBA environment. The, the renewable energy and the wider energy industry is very international. Uh, a large number of organizations, large and small, operate across more than one market. Um, uh, it's only kind of the, the utility companies, however small or large they are, that kind of, uh, and I, I don't mean all of them, there are some very significant international ones, but there's kind of a number that just focus on their home market. But, you know, uh, a lot of them operating out of London, uh, or I'm sure even in Spain, not a lot of the Spanish renewable energy players actually have global operations because they had to. Uh, back in the late 2000s, 
uh, when uh, the Spanish government changed its regulatory regime for renewables, a lot of them kind of were forced to work abroad. So if you have more than one language, leverage that because that actually becomes very relevant for them. If you've got some modeling or you don't have it, build that modeling experience so you can use it in front of them. Um, if you've got an engineering background, like Jonathan said, uh, you know this is an industry that is very focused on uh, environmental record, health and safety. Uh, these are infrastructure projects at the end of the day. So you know the process for infrastructure projects is pretty much the same or it's very similar, whether it's real estate, whether it's roads and bridges, or whether it's uh, renewable energy or oil and gas, just sometimes it's more significant depending on what it is that you're doing. So all those things are relevant. <clears throat> Try to leverage it and reinforce it in your CV, in your conversations, and in terms of the particular opportunities that you're targeting. I think uh, what I would add uh, a little bit uh, of a summary, like to go in the very first step that you should do when you are trying to find companies, etc. look at how the environment is, what you were saying a little bit, what its company does, what kind of roles are looks for them before you even look where you would uh, fit in maybe. Yeah, because yeah, there's yeah. definitely such a, such a wide variety of possibilities in the sector that um, if you are focusing only on one, you might miss it on the ones where you are a better fit and you're you might even like it better, or maybe you can change a, a, at the end. But well, what is important is to is to is to step up uh, your foot, your first foot, right in in this sector. You can then uh, change later. But then, if you are just focusing on a very narrow, if you just look at utilities, then well, I don't know what to say. Like good luck. <laughs> yeah, great. Right. So yeah, uh, definitely do your, your homework and investigate and, and ask what kind of uh, yeah, companies are, are involved in what kind of roles, profiles, departments, what they do. And, and you will see that, uh, that it's very, very wide and then very, very interesting. And you'll find something where, where you fit better than, than, than another. Yeah. yeah. And, and I want to take this opportunity to go a little bit uh, deeper and in details on uh, uh, on this, maybe give some ideas and shed some light to the to our audience on on how the, the day to day work and how the the the, the job works in uh, in the sector. So I wanted to ask a little bit in details uh, uh, to Moses and how was uh, uh, your experience uh, at uh, WeLink uh, in the specific, and then also uh, the the transition to. Um, the, the role that you have today as an uh, independent advisory, and then also, of course, uh, to, to Jonathan about his experience to Maguire. So a little bit uh, to give an idea to our audience uh, uh, about yeah, what, sure. what the world uh, looks like. Yeah, so I mean, I, I kind of touched a little bit upon this earlier because I, I joined um, uh, an entity that maybe had, let's say, 30, 40 people. Um, so it wasn't very large, um, but... Uh, you know, the, the renewable space, especially in, in Europe, has grown a lot in the last few years. And so entities like the one that I worked for um, suddenly found themselves, you know, uh, developing and then selling projects to some of the biggest investors in the world. So, you know, what a big part of my time when I was at LBS and, and a few months after was uh, taken up by uh, a transaction of, of several uh, solar projects that we were we had developed and we were selling on to um, Allianz Capital Partners, which is the investment arm of, of Allianz Insurance Group. So all of a sudden, you know, we went from kind of it, this being kind of a niche space to one where everybody and anybody kind of wanted to be there. And you have some of the biggest investors in the world uh, buying up chunks of, of portfolios. So, you know, uh, you, you kind of uh, as a small organization find that you don't actually have you know, that traditional, you know, director, manager, associate, analyst, whatever you want to call it, kind of the whole hierarchy of positions, you know, these guys responsible for finance, these guys responsible for business development, these guys responsible for project development, and so on. And instead, you have maybe some, some, some of that stuff, but kind of very loose fitting, and everybody needs to play a role. And so there's a, in my case, it was almost like, you know, we were doing mature work, but within a, within a startup environment. Um, and uh, in my case, that was great because it meant that I came, you know, as this sort of unstructured intern who uh, could work part time, but some weeks I was there full time. You know, it was kind of like all hands on deck. If you can be here more often, great. Here's a bunch of stuff. We don't have anybody else to do it for us. Um, and so I got into uh, financial modeling. I got into business development. I got into contracts negotiation. I got into project development. I got into all of the due diligence. And then I also started kind of working alongside the advisors that we had appointed to help us with 
uh, that transaction with Allianz. So, you know, there was just a really broad stream of work that I was exposed to. And I basically got a crash course in renewables. Like basically day one was May 2017 at LBS. I was still on the course. Uh, by the time I've kind of come to the end of both the MBA and that initial experience, um, I knew pretty much everything there was to know at least about solar PV in Europe. Um, and then and then kind of try and think about how I could apply that to other parts of the industry. And since then, it hasn't been too dissimilar. Um, I actually uh, kind of semi-negotiated my next position because, you know, that had gone quite well. Um, I felt like I'd, I'd added a lot of value and they felt the same. So I kind of got offered the position full time um, to to do similar work. But it was kind of just called business development. And I was like, so, you know, we know you like business development. Uh, so where do you want to do it? And I was like, well, I'll, I'll do it maybe in emerging markets. Now we've made a bit of money in Europe. There's some new places in the world where solar or wind makes sense. So can I just do some frontline business development work? Because I really enjoyed doing that when I was at Shell. So yeah, fine. So I went and I did that. But it was, again, very unstructured. This time it was a full-time position with responsibilities. Um, but you know, it wasn't a company where you could just say, hey, I now need an analyst and I now need this person. So you have to do everything yourself. Um, and uh, and that again was a continuation of my previous experience, but with the added responsibility of actually originating opportunities, uh, negotiating partnerships, um, and and kind of you know taking things from there. So um, overall, it was a very broad experience, um, and that's what I liked. I enjoyed that. I, I really really enjoyed that. And I refer back to some of the points I made earlier about how the MBA prepares you for that, or not even prepares, just allows other people to maybe accept that you're capable of doing that. Because everybody is capable to, to some extent to step up into kind of leadership and broad positions. It's just a case of whether or not the organization allows it or needs it to happen, and whether or not others, colleagues, managers, peers can, can accept that you can do that. So, so in my case, I was fortunate enough that that helped, and I did, and I was able to, and I grew into a position where I basically had a lot of responsibility. Um, and it was that experience for about two, two and a half years that allowed me to go into my kind of, let's say, more independent role now, where I'm uh, working on behalf of uh, developers who are essentially, uh, you know, trying to raise capital or sell their projects to institutional investors and others, because that's, you know, very much an experience that I've had, um, and uh, and also kind of I'm, I'm over time, and I just refers to a point that Jonathan made earlier, you know, what you do now doesn't necessarily. Uh, impact or it will influence but it won't you know it won't fundamentally change what it is that you do next so it's just part of the journey so in my case you know i had actually tried to get into a couple of the uh funds that invested in renewables that's kind of something that, I, that i've always wanted to do and i thought that was something i could do straight out of the mba i got quite close but actually it turned out you know i didn't have renewables experience and my profile wasn't a traditional banking or private equity profile so it helped a lot that I actually gained that renewables experience. I'm now, as part of my kind of current set of activities, working with some partners to, who, who've got plenty of experience in this space to, to try and establish uh, a renewable energy fund. Um, and that opportunity wouldn't have come to me if I didn't have the last two, three years worth of specific renewables experience, transaction experience in the sector and so on. Um, so it's all about you know, leveraging what you do next to get to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And remember that this is kind of a, a, a long path uh, and there will be plenty of doors that open on the back of whatever you do next. Amazing. What about you, Jonathan? So uh, my experience was a little bit more traditional, even though it was off cycle, definitely uh, analyst, associates, vice president, etc. because Macquarie is a very big... Um, a very big one, it has bank, investment banking, fund, it's a mix of everything. Um, but I, I was very lucky uh, that I was in a very small office, so it was a little bit more, so it was a little bit more structured, but I was not 100% uh, structured. And uh, what I was like all the, the whole day with the financial model, I did kind of an internal audit. It might sound boring, but <laughs> at the end of the day is what it really allowed me to devote time to know how this works. Um, at the same time, discuss with suppliers, with um, with the other departments to actually um, justify why every single number is like this or is in this range. So what, what it started as an audit uh, helped me to actually understand every single thing that is involved in, in one of these projects and from a financial role. So 
uh, actually that, that was a great uh, opportunity to 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 learn what I was a little bit maybe more lacking but we were discussing I'm an engineer and I never did finance and what I'm doing right now is uh, is actually working in, in in real transactions so actually having done that those those four months actually been nearly every single second uh, looking at the financial model is definitely now what, what it really helps me uh, do my daily work and already having had that but that in a way also in, in, in line with what you said before at the end of the day most of or most of your work or a big part of your work is um, talking to other people so that's something that either you knew already before going to the MBA or it's very difficult to, to build it afterwards um, but it's about personal relations relations right you might discuss with a supplier you might discuss with a client you might discuss we discuss with another department with another company whatever. So it's not only um, what you do in front of your laptop, it's also how you behave with the other people, how you learn from the other people, how you know to, to, to keep relationships, etc. And yes, the MBA does help you a little bit more uh, because you are in a bigger group, very international. So that, that there's this I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the, at the end of the day, there's there's many things that come intrinsic from from your experience before from your MBA that are going to be applied, and um, what will make you also, I, I guess, like get an offer or not get an offer or get get an interest or not is not only going to be well, but most of it, it's not only going to be your CV. It's going it's to be you. It's going to be you, and yeah. So so the best the best uh, side of you. Yeah, amazing experiences, and uh, it was really great to have the chance to hear from you. Um, now I wanted to, let's say, take a, a step back and uh, from from um, a higher level uh, point of view. So I wanted to uh, assume there are a lot of people in the audience that are interested in the energy sector. So um, also as an interest in general, but also as a potential areas where to um, find a job in the future. So I wanted to ask, in your opinion, what are the areas within the energy sector that you see having a, a great potential in, uh, in the next years? I go first? I, yeah. think, I think, so first of all, we've been nearly talking the whole, uh, this, this whole stream about energy sector and, and basically just talking about renewables, right? So in a way, that already shows you where, where the things are going, right? Obviously, there's still going to be traditional energy. That's not going, uh, that's not going away uh, soon. But uh, definitely anything that has to do with renewables, but even the next step, uh, immobility, of, of course, the grid is going to need, uh, need a lot of development, um, storage, hydrogen, whatever is about to come. So I guess it's all, all of the big buzzwords uh, that, that you hear every day. So that's some of them are already here, even though maybe we don't notice. Uh, but some of them obviously have a lot of potential, and and like there's gonna be there's gonna be when when you speak with anybody, um, the sector needs people, needs more people. Um, one of the the comments that I remember most in in some of my networking sessions was. I don't understand how the sector actually is so tight to people from outside because we need people. So there's no enough uh, professionals in the sector right now. There's going to need people. Uh, we're going to need people from other sectors because it, it, it has to. Maybe I think maybe COVID slowed things a little bit down, like, like everything. Not so much, uh, but definitely there's going to be a, a, a place for, or there should be a place for all of you <laughs> in the yeah. near future. Yeah, no, I, I and I share the same view. I mean, we've obviously spoken about renewables, and uh, that's clearly. I mean, in the last year or or maximum two years in particular, uh, it's become not just mainstream, but very much, uh, un, you know, highlighted as as the future and an absolute necessity because of climate change concerns. So, um, uh, it's clear that that's where things are going. Uh, but there is still a future in traditional energy. And what we're seeing actually is also a lot of the oil majors, the big energy companies uh, like Shell, where I worked, are becoming uh, energy companies, as in they're not just oil and gas, but they're kind of across the board. And they have a tradition of taking on talented people 
who become uh, very good at kind of picking up the key themes and moving between roles. So if you kind of like that sort of organization, you know, they can give you a lot of opportunities. You start off somewhere and then you just move to another part of the business, another part. And it's not just now across the oil and gas value chain like it was before. It's across all of energy. Um, and they're getting increasingly into, uh, you know, the sale of electricity amongst other things to kind of make sure that they're present across that value chain. And as you kind of hopefully progress through those sorts of organizations, you go into more leadership positions, you're going to be overseeing these kind of big energy companies that will have huge renewables portfolios, uh, a lot, a big interest in the sale of electricity, and also complementing that where necessary, uh, and whilst of course CO2 emissions allow uh, in terms of traditional uh, energy generation. So, so yeah, there's there's definitely one clear direction. I think the other question to think about is what type of uh, player do you want to be within? Uh, the energy transition. And so, uh, you know, are you going to be more of a kind of finance type of person? Are you going to be more of a investment type of person? Are you going to be more of a uh, business and market development type of person? Recognizing that, as I said earlier, depending on the organization, you might end up combining some of these things. Um, or are you going to be more of a strategist or whatever? So there are different kind of general themes that you can play within that energy transition. Um, and so, you know, I would I would argue you need to kind of think about that as much as you need to think about which part of the you know this big energy value chain uh, you want to be part of but the energy transition is dominant it will be dominant and uh, you need to take that into consideration when you when you think about where you want to be okay um now i'm going to take some questions from the audience because uh, i'm seeing uh, some uh, uh question coming from the audience uh, i will go with the um, let me see real quick. I will go with the Georgina's question. So what would be the one most important takeaway you can give a recent graduate entering the energy sector? Jonathan? Me? Uh, I think what I said already, uh, it's not easy. You're going to have to uh, work hard. But I think it's, it pays off. There's going to be a lot of opportunities, and I don't think you will regret. So yeah, no, I, I, I share the same thing. Sorry. Yeah, network. <laughs> network. Yeah. network yeah. Work hard. Everything yeah. you can. But um, yeah. Don't and don't stop. Thing. Don't stop networking once you leave. Yeah. Uh, so I, one of the things that actually really helped me was I used the LBS network uh, quite a few times when I was finding my feet. Uh, just, you know, reaching out, asking people who are doing similar things to me and having coffees with them. Sometimes I actually ended up forming partnerships for my company on the back of those sorts of conversations. So make make use of that network. Okay. And to close uh, with the, with this, uh, the question from Arsimran, um, is there something that you would have done differently in your internship search? Me, very quick, I would have started networking before also. <laughs> I'm all, all the time saying the same thing. I wouldn't change my internship for anything in the world. I'm super happy. But if I would go back, I would have started networking before. Yeah, I, I got uh, too stressed out thinking that I should have done or, or thinking that I was going to do consulting. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of wasted a month that I could have used either chilling out or uh, focusing on finding a job in energy. So. Either one would have been good. OK, amazing. I, I really enjoyed this session as we are approaching to the last minutes of our conversation. Uh, it was a really amazing talk, talking with you guys. So uh, I hope the audience uh, um, uh, got a, lo a, lot, a lot of useful insights. I apologize if we didn't get have the chance to get all the questions from, uh, from the audience. but. Uh, um i invite the the guests to uh sorry guys for what i'm about to say but i like to contact you on linkedin to, to connect with you uh, start networking also with jonathan and mosen and uh thank you very much to for your presence here and i want to invite uh, miloni back on stage for some final remarks well, that was an amazing discussion. Uh, thank you, Mosin and Jonathan, for taking the time to be with us tonight. Also, a big shout out to our backstage wizards, Naomi and Monique, for organizing this event. And of course, Francisco, 
for the very insightful questions. A uh, big thank you to all of you for attending this event and hope that you found the discussion helpful. Do keep a lookout for future events in this series and we encourage you to connect with both Jonathan and Mukeen for more insights. Have a great evening, everybody.